happening at this time. And let's get started with today's lecture. And of course, if you have any questions, don't be shy to stop me throughout, and I'd be happy to get your questions addressed. So this next chapter, which is chapter five, focuses primarily on chemical reactions and chemical equations, which is expressing chemical changes and monitoring the reactants and products and looking at, at changes in matter. Okay, so with that said, let's talk a little bit about chemical equations, which are our ways of representing and describing chemical reactions. So chemical reactions fundamentally involve both making and breaking bonds or they can involve the transfer of electrons between atoms and molecules. Now, one important law that we're gonna use a lot in this chapter is the law of conservation of mass. So conservation of mass quite simply states that atoms cannot be created or destroyed in chemical reactions. A consequence of this idea, which is really important, is that the number of atoms of each element does not change before and after a reaction. So for example, if you have hydrogen gas reacting with chlorine gas to make two molecules of hydrochloric acid, don't worry about the state symbols for now, as we notice in this reaction, we have two hydrogens and two chlorines on our reactant side, and we generate products containing two hydrogen and two chlorine atoms. So as we can see in all chemical reactions, the number of atoms of each element does not change before or after a reaction. Now this has really important ramifications that we've utilized actually in our discussion of mass mole conversions. Well, since atoms have mass, right? And the number of atoms of each element remains constant. Because atoms have mass and the number of atoms of each element is not changing, the total mass before and after a reaction does not change. So one of the examples of this is if we take hydrogen gas and we react it with oxygen gas, we can make hydrogen peroxide. Now, one thing that's really cool about this process is that we know that we have two hydrogen atoms, two oxygen atoms on the left. We have two hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms on the right. These two hydrogen atoms have a mass of two grams. These two oxygen atoms, if we have a mole of them, will have a mass of two grams per mole. And at the end of our chemical reaction, we get a molecule of hydrogen peroxide, which has a total mass of 34 grams per mole. Does everyone see how the mass on our reactant and product side is the same? And the reason for that is that the atoms of each element on the reactant and product side are identical. Does this idea of conservation of mass look familiar to everyone? Any questions so far? Is everyone able to hear me okay? Any questions on this example? Um, okay, Professor, on the uh, plus 32 grams, that was that's the mass for the oxygen? Yep, that's the total mass of the oxygen atoms on the left-hand side. And oh. as we see, if we have the same number of hydrogen and oxygen atoms on our reactant and product side, because atoms are conserved in a chemical reaction, that means that the mass of all of our reactants must match the mass of our products. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank Perfect. you. Is everyone able to hear me okay as we're continuing on with this lecture? Yes. Perfect. 
if there are any if there are any issues with the audio, just let me know and I'd be happy to troubleshoot it. Okay. So uh, one little side note, and this will come up later, but I want to bring it up in this idea of conservation, conservation of mass, conservation of matter. The same idea of conservation of atoms also applies to subatomic particles. So the total number of subatomic particles on the reactant and product side does not change during a chemical reaction. Further, and this is where this rule mainly comes up when we're talking about electrons, the number of electrons total in a chemical reaction does not change. This will come up in a later chapter when we talk about a class of reactions known as redox reactions. So now that we've set the stage with this idea of conservation of atoms, conservation of mass, we can use this idea um, to start to describe and balance chemical equations. Now, what is a chemical equation? This is going to be a refresher from chapter two. Chemical equations describe the conversion from reactants, which are the species on the left-hand side of our chemical equation that are reacting in our chemical reaction. And our reactants will react to generate products, which are the species produced from the chemical reaction. These are the chemical species on the right-hand side of our chemical equation. The reactants and products are separated by a reaction arrow shown here. And the reaction arrow indicates the transformation from reactants to products. Now, there are a few other pieces of information that we need to pay attention to as we go through today's and we as we go through today's lecture and as we look at our chemical equation. First, I'd like you to pay attention to these liquid and gas symbols. These symbols are known as our state symbols. And state symbols, quite simply, indicate the physical state of each substance. We have rules for indicating the physical states of most elements, because we talked about that earlier in chapter one. With regards to compounds, we'll talk about this a little later on in this chapter. How do we assign state symbols to different compounds? Just as a refresher, S as a state symbol stands for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, and AQ for aqueous, which can best be thought of as dissolved in water. So all chemical equations need to have descriptive state symbols because it helps us understand the reaction conditions and understand the chemical species participating in a chemical reaction. Now, most importantly, most importantly, as we notice, we have a series of numbers or coefficients in front of each of our reactant and product molecules. These are known as our reaction coefficients, and they indicate the number of each molecule, atom, or compound participating in the reaction. So this six is telling us, this reaction coefficient of six is telling us we have six water molecules that we have produced in this chemical reaction. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this look familiar? Any questions so far on this idea of chemical equations? Now, our main concern in this chapter is going to be getting the reaction coefficients correct for our chemical equation. So one important little rule that we need to remember is that the reaction coefficients must be a whole number. And the way I remember this is that half an atom has no meaning. You, you can only have the smallest subunit of matter. You can't think about a chemical equation in terms of half of an atom because half an atom doesn't behave or react like that element. 
So the reaction coefficients must be a whole number. So no fractions, no decimals. Now, there are some really interesting symbols above the reaction arrow that can indicate additives or modifications to our chemical reaction. So for example, we can have a symbol of a chemical species above the reaction arrow. This is known as a catalyst. You'll see this a lot when we talk about biological reactions because many of the reactions we see in biological systems are driven and catalyzed by proteins or other chemical species. So a catalyst, quite simply, is a chemical component that accelerates the forward and reverse reaction. The important thing about a catalyst is that they are not a reactant nor a product. They are neither consumed nor produced by a chemical reaction. So for example, iodide, which is I minus, helps facilitate this reaction and decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. It is neither produced nor consumed in the chemical reaction. You won't see a ton of catalysts in this introductory chapter, but this pops up a lot when we talk about organic chemistry and when we talk about biological reactions. The other symbol, which is pretty interesting, is this delta symbol. This delta symbol indicates that heat is added to the reaction. So for example, this reaction between aluminum and iron oxide is facilitated with heat. And heat is required for the reaction to initiate and continue efficiently. Just for those who are curious, this reaction is describing thermite, which is a pretty classic way of cutting through metal. This reaction generates a lot of heat, but it requires a little bit of heat to get started. So anytime you see the delta symbol, that implies that the reaction has to be heated or run at an elevated temperature. Do these symbols make sense to everyone? Do these symbols above the reaction arrow make sense? If it doesn't be heated, what is gonna happen? If it's not heated, the reaction will light will actually not occur at a pretty fast rate. It'll be very slow or it won't occur at all. So sometimes heat is necessary in order for a reaction to initiate and to actually go to completion, which is a good thing in a way because it, it allows us to control when a reaction actually completes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So we have the, our basic toolkit for reading chemical reactions. Now let's talk a little bit about balancing chemical equations. So let's remember our three rules. These are our three rules that you'll always want to keep in mind when talking about balancing chemical equations. So the first of which is a balanced chemical equation has the same number of atoms of each element before or after the reaction. So remember our example where we have hydrogen and oxygen reacting to make hydrogen peroxide. As you notice, we have the same number of, of hydrogen and oxygen atoms on each side of our chemical equation. Atoms are conserved in a chemical reaction. Further, and this is really important, molecules and atoms react in whole number ratios. So for example, we can only put whole numbers for our reaction coefficient. So we'd have to deal with whole numbers such as one and two rather than fractions such as one half. Always make sure your reaction coefficients are whole numbers. Finally, the reaction coefficients must be the smallest possible set of whole numbers. 
So for example, rather than like 3H2 plus 3Cl2 leads to 6HCl, we can simplify our coefficients. We can simplify our coefficients and instead write our simplified equation just as H2 plus Cl2 leads to 2HCl. So you want the simplest set of reaction coefficients and you want the smallest possible set of whole numbers. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Any, any questions on these three fundamental rules? So, Let's look at an example. So let's look at an example where we're asked to balance a chemical equation. So I'm going to give us an unbalanced chemical equation. So we're going to look at the reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to generate water. Okay. So this first step where we have to write the formula of each of our reactants and products will cover in more detail later on in this chapter. For now, we're gonna focus on once we have our chemical equation and our unbalanced chemical equation, how do we balance? How do we balance a chemical equation? Well, first you take a look at your unbalanced chemical equation and you count the number of atoms of each element in the reactants and products. So I'm gonna make a little dividing line here to help me remember I'm separating my reactants and products. And so on my reactant side, um, let's just draw a picture of hydrogen. Let's draw a picture of hydrogen. So how many hydrogen atoms do we have? Two. Two, exactly right, okay. For oxygen, I'll draw a picture as well. And how many oxygen atoms do we have on our reactant side in O2? Two. Two, yep. Perfect. So on our product side, on our product side, in water, reading off from the chemical formula, I'm going to draw a picture of water. So how many hydrogen atoms do I have? Two. Yep. And then how many oxygen atoms do I have in water? One. Yep, perfect, perfect. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to balance the atoms mentioned only once on each side of our chemical equation first by adjusting the reaction coefficients. So in this case, we notice, we notice that we have a different number of oxygen atoms on each side of our chemical equation, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna think to ourselves, how many water molecules do I need to draw to have two oxygen atoms on the right-hand side? How many water molecules do two. I need? Two, yep. So if we draw out a second water molecule, we draw out a second water molecule, we can then revise our count. So we're multiplying our count by two, and that tells us we now have four hydrogens and two oxygens. So oxygen is now balanced. Now, our next step is to balance the atoms that occur as free elements last. So looking at our count now, we see we have four hydrogens on the right-hand side, and we only have two hydrogens on the left. So, in order to balance our hydrogen atoms on each side of our chemical equation, how many additional hydrogens do I need? How many H2 molecules do I need to draw in addition? Two. Two, yep. 
So I add another H2 molecule and that in turn gives us a revised count of two times two, which gives us four hydrogens. We're gonna put our reaction coefficients in front of each of their respective chemical species. And now we're gonna rewrite our proposed balanced equation. So we have two H2 gas plus O2 gas leads to two H2O. And just to check our work, just to check our work, we see that we have four hydrogens and two oxygens on the left, and we have four hydrogens and two oxygens on the right. So we put a little check because we've balanced our chemical equation. We have the same number of atoms of each element on each side of our chemical equation. So this is an iter iterative process where we continually adjust our reaction coefficients, count our atoms of each element on the reactant and product side, and we adjust our coefficients until all of our atoms of each element are balanced on each side of our chemical equation. Does this idea make sense to everyone? Does this make sense to everyone? Yeah. So let's unpack, let's unpack the mechanics behind balancing a chemical equation. And let's look at another example where I'm going to guide you through balancing this chemical equation. And then afterwards, you'll work on an example where you have to balance an equation in small groups. So I'll, I'll get us started on this example. So we're given this classic reaction of iron and oxygen. So we're just going to rewrite our initial unbalanced chemical equation. So we're just going to write out this unbalanced chemical equation. And then what we're going to do is we're going to count the atoms of each element in the reactants and products. And to do that, and to make this really easy on us, I'm gonna draw some pictures. Really don't be shy, just like in our molecular formula chapter, pictures are really efficient at helping you count and visualize the atoms in each of our molecules. So for iron, we see that I have one iron atom. In oxygen, which is written as O2, how many oxygen atoms do we have? Two. Two, yeah. Two. Perfect, perfect. And now for iron oxide, which is Fe3O4, this formula is a little bit more complicated than our previously seen formulas, but nothing that we can't handle we see we have three iron atoms and how many oxygen atoms? Four. Four, yep, perfect. So now that we have our atom count established, so we have our atom count established. Now we count the total number of atoms of each element. We've done that already, perfect. So we can check off that box. Now we're going to identify each element with different numbers of atoms in the reactants and products. And we're gonna balance our atoms by adjusting the reaction coefficients. Okay, so which elements are not balanced? Which elements are not balanced? Iron. Which iron, yep. So iron. I'm gonna put, yep. And what other element is not balanced? Oxygen. Yep, exactly right. So I'm going to put a box. So let's just arbitrarily, let's, let's, since there's no preference for which element we balance first, let's pick and let's balance oxygen first. So my question is, how many oxygen atoms, how many, how many oxygen molecules, how many O2 molecules do I need to draw to end up with four oxygens on the left-hand side. Another way to think about it is 
two times what? Two times what number <clears throat> give us four? And as our classmate noted, we would need two oxygen molecules. So then we draw another O2 molecule. And now in total, we have four oxygen atoms on the left-hand reactant side, which matches the four oxygen atoms on our right-hand product side. Does that logic make sense to everyone? You can either use the visual method where you just draw molecules until the atoms match, or you can use the quote unquote algebraic method where you guess and you put in a number for the how many oxygen molecules would you need to have a total of four oxygen atoms? Okay, so we've balanced oxygen. As we see, we have four oxygen atoms on each side. We're now gonna balance iron. And my question to all of you is, how many iron atoms do I need to draw to have three iron atoms on the left-hand side? Three. Three. Yep, exactly right. So one way we can think about it is that one times three would give us three irons. So then we need to draw a total of three iron atoms. So now, as we can see, we've balanced all of our oxygen and iron atoms. And as a result, we're going to take our adjusted coefficients and we're going to place them in front of each chemical species. So this three goes here. So this three goes here and this two goes here. We're then gonna rewrite our chemical equation as our final form of this equation. And we're just gonna do a last minute check to make sure that we have the same number of atoms of each element on each side. So I have three irons on each side, so I'm gonna put a check. I have four oxygens on each side, so I'm gonna put a check. So this would be our final balanced chemical equation. Does this process make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense? Any questions on this example? Okay. So this next page was just an empty, an empty space, just in case we needed more space on this example. Let's now look at a new chemical equation. And what I would like us to do is I'd like us to balance this chemical equation. And I'll give everyone in this class about three to four minutes to work on this balancing example. I'd like you to take what you've learned from the previous two examples that I've done and that we've worked on together as a class. And then I'd like you to try to balance the following chemical equation. And to make things easier on everyone, I'm gonna rewrite this chemical equation. And I would like everyone to work on balancing this chemical equation and then I'd like you to type out the balanced chemical equation that you propose into the chat or uh, to save the amount of typing that you have to do. I've labeled our coefficients A, B, C, and D. And if you could tell me any of the coefficients for any of these chemical species in the chat, that would also be very helpful. So let's work on this example for about three to four minutes. Let's focus on balancing this chemical equation and let's try to write out our final reaction coefficients for each species in this molecule. And I just want you to remember, even if the chemical formula may seem a little bit complicated, Focus on just counting 
atoms. What has changed in our chemical equation? What element is not balanced? And as a hint for this problem, only one of our coefficients actually needs to be adjusted in this equation. So let's begin work on this example. Don't be shy to submit your proposed responses in the chat or verbally. And don't be shy to ask a question. A question is really invaluable for advancing our discussion and helping me get a sense of, of what part of this topic students have additional questions or concerns about and what parts I can elaborate further when we work through this problem together at the end of this three minute session. And again, don't be shy to share your responses in the chat or verbally. Uh, and you can also, if, you're, if you don't wanna post in the general chat, um, you can also post it in the private Zoom chat and I'd be happy to voice your explanation and present it in front of the class as well. So let's get started on this example and we'll discuss in about another three minutes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off from the chat and I'm going to write some proposed equations that students have presented. So one equation that we have proposed from one of your classmates is the following equation. We'll talk about each of these proposed examples in about two to three minutes, but I'm just writing out the class comments. So that way everyone can visualize what your classmates are thinking and presenting. So don't be shy to contribute your responses in the chat and we'll continue to work on this example. And again, if you have a question, don't be shy to ask it verbally or post in the chat, either in the public or private chat. And I'd be happy to get your questions answered. So let's try to get a few more responses in the chat before we discuss. And we'll talk about this example in about two minutes. You can also comment whether you agree or disagree with any of the proposed student responses. Um, that also helps me get a sense of where the class is at. And don't be shy to, to share your own response or to disagree if your response is a little bit different. It's important for this, these class discussions for us to make sure we hear as many perspectives and as many questions as possible. So I notice in the chat, we have a large amount of agreement with the proposed balanced equation. Let's keep working on this example and we'll discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. And of course, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask. It's great to see that the class is pretty, seems pretty comfortable with this concept when balancing this equation. Does anyone have another proposal for our balanced equation? Does anyone have a different proposal? Um, does anyone want to voice their agreement or disagreement with this proposed balanced equation? Just want to give everyone else in the class an opportunity to propose their responses. I see a, a number of responses in the chat, which is wonderful to see. Um, does anyone else have an, a perspective or opinion that they'd like to share on this example? Or does anyone have a question that I can address on this example?
Okay, perfect, perfect. So we have our proposed balanced chemical equation. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna walk us through step by step on how I personally would go about balancing this equation. The end result, the proposed balanced equation was perfect. It was exactly correct. But let's talk more about the mechanics behind balancing this equation and the logic behind balancing this equation. So looking at our reactant side in C6H6, I have six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. In bromine, I have two bromine atoms, okay? In C6H4Br2, I have six carbons, four hydrogens, and two bromine atoms. In HBr, I have one hydrogen and one bromine atom. Now, it's really important that when you do your preliminary counts, you pay attention to the total number of atoms. So in total, for our total number of atoms, I, on the right-hand side, I have six carbons, five hydrogens, and three bromines. Okay, on the right-hand, sorry, so on the right-hand side, we have six carbons, five hydrogens, and three bromines. On the left-hand side, we have six carbons, six hydrogens, and two bromines. So just working along procedurally, which elements are not balanced? Which elements have different number of atoms of that element on each side of our chemical equation? Bromine. Bromine, yep, exactly right. What else? What other element is not balanced? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Now, you may say, well, looking at, looking at my reactants and products, where should I start? And if we remember our rules, we remember that we balance our three elements last. Why? Well, they're the easiest to balance. They're, they have the less moving parts as part of their chemical equation. So if we have to pick, we can balance bromine or hydrogen. I'm gonna start with hydrogen. Okay, I have six hydrogens on the left. I have five hydrogens on the right. And since carbon's already balanced, we're going to leave the, the C6H4Br2 alone. Carbon's already balanced. We have carbon balanced. Let's leave that alone for now. So we're going to try to adjust the coefficient of HBr. And our end goal is to get two hydrogens and two bromines. So that way, our revised total will have six carbons, six hydrogens, and four bromines. So we wanna make sure we have six hydrogens on each side. So what coefficient do we need in front of HBr to balance hydrogen? Two. Two, exactly right, wonderful. So now that we've balanced our coefficient for HBr, we revise our count. We revise our count. So here's our new count. So we have six carbons, six hydrogens, and four bromines. Carbon is still balanced, but bromine is not balanced. So if we have four bromines on the right and two bromines on the left, two times what would give us four bromines? What coefficient do we need in front of Br2? Two. Two, yep, exactly right. Perfect. So key features from this discussion. First, we balance our free elements last. Second, we focus on adjusting our reaction coefficients for our simplest chemical species. 
We don't want to mess with this formula that has carbon because carbon's already balanced. Finally, we keep updating our total counts of the atoms of each element and adjusting our coefficients step by step. Finally, we check our work. We see that we have the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms. When we revise our count, we see we have six carbons, six hydrogens, and four bromines on the left-hand side. And checking our count, we see we have six carbons, six hydrogens, and four bromines on each side. So this equation is balanced. Let's now rewrite our balanced equation with all of our adjusted coefficients. This is a, actually a reaction that we'll see again in organic chemistry. So here's our complete balanced equation. Does this process make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense? Any questions on this example? Overall, the student responses that I saw for this problem solving session were perfect. And it's great to see students sharing their thoughts as we worked through this problem. And as we then came together as a class to discuss this problem one last time. Any last minute questions on this example before we work on another example of balancing chemical equations? Well, if you, if you think of any other questions, don't be shy to type them in the chat or to ask them verbally. Let's do another group problem solving example where we're asked to balance the following chemical equation. I'm going to rewrite it just so that way the, the text is a little bit easier to see and it's easier for students to potentially write in the coefficients. Just want to make sure we have enough space just so that way if, if students want to write on our class whiteboard using the annotate feature they have enough space to do so okay so let's now take about three to four minutes and let's try to balance the following chemical equation and again i'm going to label my coefficients a, B, C, and D. And I'd like everyone to balance this chemical equation. Ah. Where's the oxygen? Okay. This should be water. There we go. There we go. Perfect. So this is a classic acid-base reaction that generates water via the reaction of hydrochloric acid and a base, which would be a hydroxide source. So now that we have the following balanced chemical equation, and now that we've made sure that our chemical equation accurately reflects our chemical reaction, let's now take about three to four minutes to balance this chemical equation now that we have the correct chemical species and let's adjust our coefficients and let's try to share our proposed balanced equation in the chat and let's try to share our proposed coefficients in the chat. Additionally, if you want, you can also share by writing on the class whiteboard and filling in the coefficients using the class annotate feature. So don't be shy to share a proposed response or a question that you have. So we already have a student uh, writing using the annotate feature and sharing their proposed coefficient for this equation. Let me write out their proposed 
balanced equation. And let's keep working on this example. And I'd like students to comment whether they agree with this proposed balanced equation, whether they disagree with this proposed balanced equation, or if they have an alternative set of coefficients that they'd like to share with the class. So this is one of our student proposed balanced equations. I'd like everyone to keep working on this example and I'd like to get some questions and comments if you agree with this proposed equation, if you disagree, or if you have an alternative balanced equation that you'd like to share. So let's keep working on this example for about another two minutes and let's get some responses into the in the chat whether students agree or disagree with the proposal. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask using the public or the private Zoom chat, or you can also contribute your drawings onto the class whiteboard as well. I want everyone to have a fair amount of time to work on this example. So let's continue to work through this example for about another minute and a half to two minutes. And I'd like to see some additional student responses in the chat, just to make sure everyone's comfortable with this example and that there aren't any questions that I can address. So does everyone agree with this proposal? Does everyone disagree? Does anyone have an alternative balanced equation? Don't be shy to share your perspective in the chat and we'll discuss this example in another minute and a half. And the more shared perspectives that we have, the more I can accurately address the class concerns when we go over this problem together as a group. So looking at the chat, we see a lot of students agreeing with this proposed response. Um, I wanna give the students who have not yet responded an opportunity to share their opinion and perspective. Um, if there's any part that they have questions about in this problem as they were working through this problem, do they have any proposals? We see a few more students sharing that they're so far in agreement with this proposed balanced equation. Let's give everyone a few more, a few moments to share some of their other perspectives. And if there is any additional comments that they have when working through this example, and we'll go through over this example as a class momentarily. Okay, so allow me a moment to clear the student annotations. It's great that students are sharing their responses and that they're utilizing the annotate tool as well as the chat to share their responses with me during these lecture sessions. So let's first start out with our logic in this process. So first things first, before we'd even focused on balancing the equation, we made sure that our chemical equation was correct. Um, in later chapters, you may have to write out the formulas of your reactants and products and make sure the formulas of your, re your reactants and products are written correctly. Once we have our preliminary balanced equation, once we have our preliminary balanced equation, 
Then we're gonna count the atoms of each element. So in aluminum hydroxide, remember this subscript of three applies to all atoms in our parentheses. So we have one aluminum. How many oxygens do we have in aluminum hydroxide? Just to make sure we're on the same page. Three. Three, exactly right. We have three oxygens. And by the same token, we have three hydrogens. In hydrochloric acid, I have one hydrogen and one chlorine. Stylistically, I like to line up my atoms of the same element, just so that way it's easier for me to add them together. It's optional, but organizationally, it helps keep things organized. For aluminum chloride, I have one aluminum and three chlorines. And in water, I have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Perfect, so I have my basic atom count. I have my basic atom count. I'm gonna do a quick note of my total atoms. So in total on the left-hand side, I have one aluminum, three oxygens. How many hydrogen atoms in total do I have? How many hydrogens do I have in total? Four. Yep, exactly right. Four hydrogens because three plus one gives us four and we have one chlorine. So that's on our reactant side. On our product side, I have one aluminum, three chlorines, one oxygen, and two hydrogen. So now that I have my atom counts established, I'm going to identify my unbalanced, my unbalanced elements. So which elements are not balanced in this equation? Which elements are not balanced? Oxygen. Oxygen, okay, so I'm gonna put a circle around oxygen. What else? Chlorine. Yep, exactly. Chlorine. Yes, and I heard someone else mention, uh, could you repeat that please? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yep, perfect. Okay, perfect. So, we really can pick any of these to start out, any of these elements would be fine to start balancing. But following our rules, it's preferred that we balance our elements found in the least number of compounds first. So I think it would be reasonable if we started with either oxygen or chlorine because they show up in the least number of compounds compared to hydrogen, which is just all over the place. So. Let's start with chlorine, let's start with chlorine. So we want three chlorines on each side. So our goal is three chlorines. So my question to all of you is, what times one would give us three? What is three? Yep, so we put a coefficient of three and we multiply each of our atoms. That gives us three chlorines and three hydrogen. That in turn means we have to revise our count as we now have three chlorines and six hydrogens in total on the left. So we adjusted our coefficient, we revised our count. Perfect. So now that we have our revised count, let's now balance oxygen. So looking at oxygen, I have three oxygens on the left and I have one oxygen on the right. So what times one? What times one would give us three oxygens? And again, we use a coefficient of three. That in turn gives us three oxygens and six hydrogens. So we adjust our count. Now looking at our final total count, we see that we have one aluminum on each side. 
we have three chlorines on each side, three oxygens on each side, and six hydrogens on each side. So we have completely balanced this equation. And now as a last step to make things easy on us, we're just going to rewrite this equation. So I'm gonna rewrite my final equation as aluminum hydroxide. Let me check the state symbol just to make sure. Aqueous, okay. Plus three HCl aqueous leads to aluminum chloride aqueous plus three H2O liquid. So here's our complete balanced chemical equation. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense? Is everyone comfortable with this example? Yes. Any questions, any concerns, any comments on this example? Professor, I just have something that I'm curious about. When you labeled the um, hydrogen um, chloride, um, does it matter if we put like the H first and then the Cl, or why is it that we put oh, the Cl uh, the, before? Uh, the only reason why I put the Cl before is just so that way in the in each row, I can add up my hydrogens without having to to look too far. Oh. Okay, right across each other. Okay. Yeah. It just makes it a little bit easier in terms of performing the addition to get your total count. But you can write it however you want. This is okay. just the way that I like to format it, um, just because it's, it's easiest for me to keep track of all my different elements if I have them arranged in, in the same row. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So we've seen one major method of balancing chemical equations. Let's now look at another method. Now this method is known as the table method. This is a method that helps you keep track of all of your atoms in a very procedural way. We've actually been using pieces of the table method in our earlier balancing equation examples. Now I just wanna be 100% clear on this you can balance chemical equations using any method that you prefer. Whichever method you find easiest or that works for you, that's the method that, that you likely should want to use. I'm just going to present this alternative method for balancing equations and this other way of organizing your thoughts when balancing chemical equations, because as I found some students really like this method, some students, personally would prefer the method that we used earlier on in this chapter. I Which just, one was that? Was that just, just uh, labeling and balancing chemical equations, the one we just finished using? Yes, the, I, it's also called the, the guess and check method. Um, and this new method is called the table method. And whichever process works for you, you're more than welcome to use it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Let's look at the following example. We're looking at the reaction between phosphoric acid and sodium sulfide to yield hydrogen sulfide and sodium phosphate. Okay, so this table may look daunting at first, but it's really a way of breaking down our chemical equation and looking at each species in our chemical equation. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to write out my reactant molecules. So I have phosphoric acid and sodium sulfide. Wonderful, okay? For my products, I'm gonna write out my products, which are hydrogen sulfide and sodium phosphate, okay? So now that I filled in that portion of the table, I'm just drawing this dark vertical line to separate my reactants and products. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna count the atoms. So in phosphoric acid, what atoms do we have? How many atoms of each element do we have? Let's list them. 
in phosphoric acid, what do we have to work with? Three hydrogen. Yep, we have three hydrogen. What else? One phosphorus. One phosphorus. And how four many? Four oxygen. Yep, four oxygens. Okay. We cannot yeah. see what you're writing, Professor. Um, how about now? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, perfect. So just as a recap, we have three hydrogens, one phosphorus, and four oxygens in phosphoric acid. We obtained these numbers from our chemical equation. In sodium sulfide, how many atoms of each element do we have? What, what atoms do we have in sodium sulfide? Two sodium. Two sodium. One sulfur. One. Exactly right. Likewise, in hydrogen sulfide, we have two hydrogens and one sulfur. And in sodium phosphate, we have three sodiums, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. Okay, we're gonna leave this total column on the right blank for now. We're just gonna leave it alone for now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the total atoms of each element before we've adjusted any of our coefficients. So in total, we have three hydrogens, one phosphorus, four oxygen, two sodium, and one sulfur. On the right-hand side, I have two hydrogens, three sodium, one phosphorus, one sulfur, and four oxygen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my red pen and I'm going to circle all of my elements that are not balanced. So which elements are not balanced? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yep. So I'm going to circle hydrogen. What else? Sodium. Yep, sodium's not balanced. What about sulfur? Is sulfur okay? Yes. Perfect. Are there any other elements that are not balanced? No. Okay, wonderful. Now, I'm going to show you a really cool trick that is really easy to see with the table method. So if we wanted to balance hydrogen, if we wanted to balance hydrogen, we would want the same number of hydrogen atoms on each side of our chemical equation. A fast way to get the same number of atoms of each element is to look at the number of atoms of each element in our two chemical species. So I have three hydrogens on the left and two hydrogens on the right. And what we do is we put the number of atoms on the opposite side of our chemical equation as our reaction coefficient. This can also be thought of as finding the least common multiple between our two atom counts. So just as a side note, we're using the idea that three times two gives us six. So if our goal is to have six hydrogens on each side, three times two would give us six hydrogens. And on the right-hand side, what coefficient do we need to get six? Three. Three. Exactly right. This least common multiple method works great if you have an element found in two chemical species on opposite sides of your chemical equation. Now, let's adjust our atom count. So we have six hydrogens, one times two, gives us two phosphorus, and four times two gives us eight oxygen. The reason why I like the table method is it makes this math in terms of adjusting your atom counts really easy to fall. So we have two times three, six hydrogens on the right, and one times three, which gives us three sulfurs on the right. Okay. Applying this same logic, applying the same logic to sodium, we see we have two sodiums on the left, three sodiums on the right. 
So we're going to use the least common multiple method. Two times three gives us six. So I'm going to put what coefficient goes in front of sodium sulfide? What? Three. Um, three. Yeah. So that gives me six sodiums and three sulfurs. And what coefficient goes in front of sodium? Two. two. And that in turn gives us six sodium, two phosphorus, and eight oxygen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down my revised count. I'm going to write down my revised count. So I have six hydrogens. Oops, let me use a different color. So I have six hydrogens, two phosphorus, eight oxygen, six sodium, and three sulfur. I have six hydrogens, two phosphorus, eight oxygen. Hydrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sodium, six sodium, and three sulfurs. So as we can see, all of our atoms of each element are balanced. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my coefficients and I'm going to put them in front of my chemical equation. So this is the table method in a nutshell. You count your atoms in each reactant and product and you sequentially adjust your coefficients. As we notice, the table method is really wonderful at making sure your atom counts are accurate and helping you organize and notice patterns so you can use shortcuts, such as the least common multiple method. Does everyone understand the table method? Does it, do people like this method, dislike this method? It's a great way if you're taking an exam and want to be 100% sure that your equation's balanced. It's a great way of doing detailed bookkeeping for a chemical equation. Of course, if your equation is really simple, you can use the guess and check method, but it helps keep things organized, which is important. And just as a side note, if you want, when you're working through problems or even when you take your exam, you can print out the template, which just has the blank table. And you're welcome to use the blank table as part of working through any of the problems on the quizzes, homework, and notes. And I can even put this um, template as a blank template for you to use on Canvas as well, if you prefer. Okay, so that's the table method. It's very procedural and it, it allows us to use some pretty nice shortcuts. So this was just blank space in case we needed some more space working through this problem. I always try to make sure that students never run out of space. So now that we've seen an example of balancing equations using the table method, I'd like everyone to break out into small groups and I'd like everyone to try and balance the following chemical equation using the table method. And I'd like everyone to share their responses either using the annotate tool or by sharing the balanced equation typed in the chat or by sharing the coefficients in the chat. This example looks a little bit intimidating, but if you take it one step at a time and you balance one element at a time, you're more than capable of handling this problem and if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask your question verbally or in the public or private chat. And I'd be happy to voice your comment and answer your question in front of our group. So let's take about 
four to five minutes for this example, a little bit longer because this equation is a little more difficult than usual. And if you want, you can share, let me just make sure the formulas that I've transcribed, there we go, perfect. And don't be shy, you can also share your responses by writing in your coefficients or helping fill in this table using the annotate feature. So let's work for about four minutes on this example. And if there are any questions I can address or any proposed balanced equations that I can share from the chat, please let me know and I'd be happy to do so. The more responses we have, the more nuance the discussion we can engage with. Also, I found the act of formulating and sharing a response is invaluable at integrating the material. So the mere act of talking through a problem is really informative in terms of developing these problem solving skills. So we have a, a student proposing their balanced chemical equation. I'll write the, the proposed equation once again, so that way students can see and comment. And if students want, you can comment whether you agree on this proposed example, whether you disagree on this student proposal, whether you have your own take on this balanced chemical equation. Of course, um, please take as much time as, as you need to come up with your proposed balanced equation. I just wanna make sure any student comments or any student proposals are shared in front of the class. So that way we can build our discussion off of that. Whether you agree, whether you disagree, whether you have an alternative method, whether you have a question, don't be shy to share your proposed responses or questions in the chat or verbally. And we'll discuss in about another three and a half minutes. So we have some students commenting that they agree. I'd like students to continue to work through this problem and share their perspective. And it's okay to disagree. Um, and the more work and the more of your logic that you share, the more that I can help communicate that logic and share your perspective with the class. Um, or you, you're more than welcome to, to unmute and share your perspective as well. Whatever works for facilitating and advancing this class problem solving session. So let's keep working on this example and we'll discuss in about another two and a half to three minutes. And I'd like to see a few more responses before we have our final group discussion.
And again, don't be shy to ask a question in the chat or verbally or share your perspective, whether you agree with this pro proposal, whether you have a different set of coefficients. I really want to hear your perspective so that way I can fine tune how I go over this problem to provide the most informative value. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute and a half to two minutes. So we see a few more students communicating in the chat that they agree with this proposed uh, set of coefficients. This is quite an interesting reaction overall. Let's keep working on this example. If there's any part you're stuck on when balancing these equations, don't be shy to let me know. And we'll continue on and we'll discuss this example as a group in about one minute. Do we have any last minute responses in terms for this problem? Does anyone have any last minute proposals? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Are there another set of coefficients that you obtained when you tried to balance this equation? Let's give everyone the opportunity to share their last thoughts before we go over and discuss the instructor solution. Perfect. So allow me a moment to clear the annotations and let's now discuss this example. Okay, so first things first, in the table method, we write out each of our reactants and products. So we have H2SiCl2 and H2O. On the product side, I have H8Si4O4 and hydrochloric acid. Okay, now we count our atoms. So I have two hydrogens, one silicon, and two chlorines. In water, I have two hydrogens and one oxygen. In H8Si4O4, how many atoms of each element do we have? Let's try to get some class contribution here. How many atoms of each element do we have? Eight hydrogen. Yep, we have eight hydrogen. How many? Four, yep. four silicon. Yep, and then we also have four oxygen. Four oxygen. Yep, exactly right. Perfect. For hydrochloric acid, we have one hydrogen and one chlorine. Okay. Perfect. So now that we have our atom counts, let's focus on let's focus on our preliminary total so i have four hydrogens one silicon two chlorines and one oxygen on the left and i have eight hydrogens four silicon whoops not eight eight plus one which would give us nine hydrogens four silicon four oxygen and one chlorine on the right Okay, so now that we have our preliminary atom counts, let's circle which atoms are not balanced. Which atoms are not balanced? Hydrogen. Uh, uh, what was that? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yep, so let's circle hydrogen. Silicon. Silicon, okay, and what else? Oxygen. Oxygen, yep, and even chlorine. This whole equation is not balanced. So where do we start? Well, as a general rule, we balance the elements found in the least number of compounds first. So as we notice, hydrogen is all over the place. So let's not start with hydrogen. Let's, let's save hydrogen to the end. Um, we can start with silicon. We, 
um, chlorine and water when oh, we can balance oxygen. Now in this tie, one rule that really helps me organize my thoughts is I also like to balance the elements found in the most complicated molecules first. So I see that silicon is found in molecules that contain a bunch of different atoms of many different elements. So I'm going to balance silicon first, just so that way um, I don't have to deal with balancing silicon at the end and messing up my balance elements of my other species. Okay, so I see I have four silicons on the right. So if I want four silicons on the left, what coefficient do I need to use? One times what would give us four? Four. Four. So then we apply our adjusted coefficient to each of our atoms, and that gives us eight hydrogens, four silicons, and eight chlorines. Wonderful. Okay, now looking at my revised count, chlorine is still a problem. So let's balance chlorine next. Why am I choosing chlorine next? Well, because hydrogen is found in so many chemical species in this reaction. So let's leave hydrogen towards the end. So what we're gonna do is we're going to balance chlorine. So as we see, we have eight chlorines on the right-hand side. So one times what would give us our desired eight chlorines? What eight. We need a coefficient of eight, exactly right. So that gives us eight hydrogens and eight chlorines. Okay, now as we notice, oxygen is still unbalanced. So let's balance oxygen next. We have four oxygens on the right, so we need four oxygens on the left. So what coefficient do we need to guess? One. one times one times what would give us four? Four. Four, exactly right. You are correct in noting that the coefficient for this giant molecule here is one as well. Okay. So applying our adjusted coefficient, we have eight oxygens. Oh, oh sorry, we have eight hydrogens because four times two gives us eight and four oxygens. It's always important just to check your arithmetic because um, it's a small math error could make the problem way more complicated than it has to be. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write out my total atom count after using each of my adjusted coefficients. So I have 16 hydrogens, four silicones, four oxygens and eight chlorines. And on the right hand side, I have 16 hydrogens, four silicones, four oxygens and eight chlorines. So as I can see, each of my atoms of each element are balanced. Does that make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense? Is everyone comfortable with this process? And does everyone see that we've now arrived at a balanced equation? Can I get some confirmation in the chat or verbally that everyone's comfortable with this so far and that everyone's following along so far? Yes. Perfect. So remember as a last step, and I, I, I wanna bring this up because I've seen this mistake happen um, and it's always, I can figure out what the student meant to convey, but it's always a little puzzling. Make sure to put your final coefficients in your equation and then box your final balanced equation. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, so when we're, looking, when we're looking at our reactant atoms, um, what is it exactly that we're looking, looking at to see which one is the least one that we're gonna pick? Ah, 
So what would be helpful? So like the reason why we started by balancing silicon, do you notice how just at a first glance that silicon is found in molecules that have many different elements. They're really complicated molecules, right? Mm -hmm. So right. we wanna we want balance the atoms found in complicated molecules first, if possible, because any change in the coefficient changes our atom counts for many different elements. So you start with, with the most complicated molecules and then you move to the least complicated. And that way, you can minimize the amount of times you have to keep adjusting your coefficients. Okay, Does that so in this in this um, problem, the least um, least one is the the silicon. Uh, so the the most comp the the element found in the most complicated molecules is silicon. That's so the, yeah. Most complicated, then. and that's okay. why we balance silicon first because it's found in one molecule on each side, and those molecules are very complex. So we want to adjust our coefficients on the complicated molecules first, so that way we don't have to go back and keep adjusting the coefficient later on. Note that 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 discussion is just a guideline. If you can reach the same final answer by adjusting the coefficients in a different priority order, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I, I, I always like to follow a, per, a procedural method with clear rankings for what step to do first and last because it just makes things easier to organize. But note that there are many different ways to balance equations and this is just the method that I personally prefer. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect, perfect. So I'm very pleased with how the class has contributed to our discussion of this example. Let's keep going now. And I just provided empty space. So that way, if you ran out, we needed, and we needed a little more space, we had that space. Let's talk next about how to translate, let's translate phrases into chemical reactions. How do we write chemical reactions from text? So chemistry has its own language, but there is a translation, a way for us to translate words into chemical reactions and chemical equations. So let's talk a little bit about that. Anytime you hear the phrase react, to give, and to yield, that is describing our good old friend, the reaction arrow. These words indicate the transformation of reactants to products. If you hear the word and or reacts with, that's a plus sign. That tells us we have multiple species on our reactant or product side. Upon heating, we put the little delta symbol. Catalyzed by, we take our reaction arrow and we put our catalyst. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the formulas. Let's talk a little bit about the formulas. We happen to know the formulas of our elements. And as a refresher, elements can be either atomic or molecular. Our atomic elements, as a reminder, are our metals and noble gases. So for example, if you hear the word sodium, if you hear the word sodium, that's referring to the atomic symbol Na. Is sodium a metal? Yes. Yes. So as a result, we'd write the formula of sodium as Na salt. So as we notice, we write sodium as an atomic element. We only have one atom in the formula. Does that make sense? Yes. Likewise, when we're dealing with noble gases, so let's suppose we're, we, we have the phrase neon. We won't commonly see noble gases in chemical reactions because they aren't particularly reactive, but they can react under certain very extreme conditions. So neon 
corresponds to the symbol Ne. Neon is a noble gas. So how many atoms should I have in its formula? If it's a noble gas, if it's an atomic element, how many atoms should I have One. in its formula? One. And because it's a noble gas, as the name implies, it's a gas. Does that process make sense? Does this look familiar to everyone? Our atomic elements, does that look familiar? Yes. Perfect. Now our molecular elements contain two or more atoms, and these are primarily going to be our nonmetals or our metalloids. The most prolific subclass of molecular elements are the diatomic elements, which consist of two atoms and only two atoms of that element chemically bonded. These include our halogens, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. So for example, if we are given the name fluorine, fluorine has a chemical symbol F and fluorine is a 7A element, otherwise known as a halogen. So how many atoms are part of fluorine's formula? Two. Two. So we'd write fluorine as F2 gas. We'll talk more about this state symbol later on. Just as a reminder, all the way from chapter two, we know that fluorine is a gas. Okay, let's try another example. If we look at hydrogen, which has the symbol for H, Hydrogen, based on this rule, is diatomic. So how many atoms of hydrogen should I put as part of its chemical formula? Two. Two. We'd write hydrogen as H2 gas. You are responsible for being able to write the chemical formula of elements. When we talk about compounds, um, we'll, we'll elaborate and we'll see some examples later on in this chapter where you have to deal with the formulas of compounds. But for elements, that's something you definitely have to have down. Um, as many chemical reactions, especially displacements, generate samples of pure elements. Okay, so let's keep going now and let's talk about our polyatomic elements. These are sulfur and phosphorus. So sulfur can be written as S8 solid, while phosphorus is written as P4 solid. Does this look familiar to everyone? Does this yes. look familiar? Perfect. So let's talk about the physical states of elements and compounds. Remember, in chemical equations, we have to take the state symbols quite seriously. The state symbol indicates the physical state of each substance. S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, and AQ for aqueous, which is just a fancy way of saying it's dissolved in water as part of a solution. Metals are solids at room temperature. So sodium, aluminum, zinc. Um, what about... Let's pick a, let's pick a random metal. Um, what about potassium? What state symbol should I have for potassium? Solid. Solid. Okay. Likewise, if we if we have the phrase lithium, lithium has the symbol Li. And what physical state will we give for lithium? Solid. Solid. Yep. Yeah. There's one exception. Mercury happens to be a liquid. There's been a lot of studies as to figuring out and sort of rationalizing, why is mercury a liquid? And it owes to its unique properties as an element. Okay, so metals, pretty straightforward. If it's a metal, it's a solid, except for mercury, of course. For the non-metals, for the non-metals, the noble gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine are gases. So if I say the phrase oxygen, we know oxygen is diatomic. And what state symbol do we put for oxygen? Gas. Gas. 
Likewise for hydrogen, we write it as H2 gas. Nitrogen would be N2 gas. And I just want you to keep in mind for non-metals, there is only one liquid and that is bromine. Bromine is a liquid at room temperature. Again, owing to its unique chemical properties. Now, most other non-metal and metalloid elements are solid. So for example, iodine would be a solid. So if you have to guess, overwhelmingly, most elements are solids. Now for covalent compounds, oftentimes the physical state of covalent compounds are given in the chemical reaction description. So if we say liquid ethanol, what state symbol should I put? L. L, yep. Carbon monoxide gas, so CO, what state symbol should I put? Yes. Yep, exactly. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay, perfect. Any questions on this topic? Okay, so let's keep going now. And let's talk a little bit about aqueous solution. So when we think about an ionic compound, such as, for example, sodium sulfide, soluble ionic compounds and strong acids will dissociate into their ions in solution. And we denote compounds dissolved in water by the aqueous symbol. So anytime you have a soluble ionic compound, covalent compound, or acid, it's denoted by the aqueous symbol. A solution of a compound in water indicates we have an aqueous species. So for example, if we say the phrase, a solution of sodium chloride, we'd write this as NaCl aqueous. Does that make sense? Does everyone see how this keyword tells us to put the aqueous symbol? Yeah. Likewise, uh, a solution of glucose, we'd write C6H12O6. And because it's a solution of glucose, what symbol should we put? Aqueous. Aqueous, exactly right. Now to look at an example of an acid, a solution of acetic acid would be written as CH3CO2H aqueous. Note, because we've gone over the nomenclature rules, you can be expected to have to write out the formula from the name. As a refresher on that, for sodium chloride, we have sodium plus and Cl minus. We cross our charges and get NaCl. For acetic acid, it's derived from acetate and H plus. We cross our charges and we get CH3CO2H. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect, perfect. So, Insoluble compounds are denoted by a solid, liquid, or gas symbol, while immiscible compounds are denoted by a liquid symbol. So for example, hexanes and water are immiscible liquids and do not mix. So we'd write out hexane. If it's immiscible, what state symbol does miscibility tell us? Liquid. liquid. So we'd write hexanes as a liquid, and water, we all know intuitively, is a liquid. What does the immiscible mean? Uh, immiscible means that the two liquids do not mix to form a homogeneous solution. So if we think about the classic analogy of oil and water, if we mix, if we try and mix oil and water, we know that our water and our hexanes, which is very much like oil, 
do not mix. These two liquids are immiscible. Miscible or immiscible is, is telling us whether or not a set of liquids will mix to form a homogeneous solution. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. So another keyword you need to look out for is precipitate. So a precipitate is a solid formed from a chemical reaction. A precipitate is overwhelmingly an insoluble ionic compound. And precipitates are indicated with a solid symbol S. So for example, a precipitate of silver chloride would be written as AgCl solid. Precipitate, I want you to think solid. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Most gases are insoluble in water. So hydrogen and oxygen would be written with the gaseous symbol. So in water, most gases don't dissolve in an appreciably large amount for the purposes of writing chemical equations. Most pure elements as well are insoluble in aqueous solution. So you just write the state symbol for that element at room temperature. So if, for example, if we have a block of copper in water, copper would be written as Cu. And because it's a metal, what state symbol would we put? Um. Solid, exactly right. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So let's do a last capstone example, applying this process of writing our chemical equation from the name. So carbon monoxide, which has the formula CO, and so this and symbol tells us to put a plus hydrogen gas. So carbon monoxide gets the gas symbol, hydrogen. What's the formula for hydrogen? What's the formula for hydrogen? H2. H2, exactly. They react to give. So this phrase, react to give, what do we write? Arrow. Yep, react to give tells us we write our reaction arrow and they react to give a liquid with the formula CH3OH. So we write out CH3OH and we put the liquid state symbol. So this is our first step. All we've done so far is we've written out our preliminary unbalanced chemical equation. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna count our atoms of each element. And as we can see, which element is not balanced in this chemical equation? Which element is not balanced in this chemical equation? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. We see we have four hydrogens on the right, while well, we only have two hydrogens on the left. So what coefficient do we need? What times two what times two would give us four hydrogens? Two. Two, exactly right. So we're gonna plug in our coefficient of two to give us four hydrogens. And now our entire equation is balanced. So we'll put a box around this final balanced equation and that is it. So the only thing that's new now is that we have to apply what we've learned with our nomenclature rules to write the formula of each of our different elements and compounds. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So this is a great stopping point for today. So I'll be ending the recording.